when people talk about the future, I think you often see two groups of people. You, you hear about the techno-optimists who talk about how technology is ultimately going to solve all of our problems, and you, talk, you hear about the techno-pessimists who point out that technology is destroying jobs. Um, I think, in some sense, both of those groups are not only wrong, but they actually make the same mistake. Erik Bren Jolsen is professor aan het MIT, ondernemer en schrijver. Hij vertelt in het komend kwartier over hoe technologische ontwikkelingen, met name robots, onze economie en maatschappij gaan veranderen. Welkom bij Tegenlicht Talks. Around the late 1700s, early 1800s, humans began to harness machines, particularly the steam engine, to augment the power of their muscles. And that set off an incredible increase in human living standards, unlike anything in the previous centuries or, or millennia. Now we're at the early stages of what we're calling the second machine age, where machines are beginning to not just augment muscles, but also our brains, be able to make decisions. And we also think that the second machine age will lead to huge increases in living standards, much like the first machine age, but it's also different. It may be that some of the tasks that humans used to do are no longer necessary, and this is already leading to some big disruptions in the labor markets and in income inequality. Well, I think we're on the cusp of two of the biggest events in human history. The first is true machine intelligence, machines that can solve all sorts of problems, think, communicate much the way we do with other humans. And this, of course, will be an important milestone in history because we've never had machines like that before. And everything going forward will be very different once you have machines that have that kind of intelligence. The second thing is we are on the beginning of creating a global digital community of all the people through the internet, um, mobile phones, and digital networks more broadly, we are going to have six, seven, eight billion people connected, all their brains. They'll all be able to tack in, tap into the world's information and use it. But perhaps more importantly, they'll all be able to contribute to the world's information. And that will multiply the ability to have innovations and creativity. Well, technology for at least 200 years has been destroying jobs and has also been creating jobs. But recently, there's been an acceleration around the second machine age, and especially just the past five or 10 years with big data and other new breakthroughs in artificial intelligence that have rapidly sped up the ability of machines to do things that previously only humans could do. For instance, now we are able to talk to our machines our phones, and we expect them to understand, not perfectly, but beginning to understand what we say and carry out our instructions. That would have been science fiction 10 years ago. Now I've been able to, with Andrew McAfee, my co-author, sit in a car that drives itself all the way from Mountain View, California, up to San Francisco and back again. We now have machines that can play the game of Jeopardy and make medical diagnosis. We have machines that can write uh, simple sports stories and news stories. These are all things that would have been impossible as recently as 10 years ago. And we don't think that these are the final, ultimate achievements of the second machine age. These are just the warm-up acts, the beginning of an even bigger set of changes in the next decade or two. We can see more clearly some of the technological changes because many of them are already happening. The impacts on our economy and society are harder to know because they'll depend on our choices. But we foresee at least two broad categories of changes that are already beginning to happen. One we call the bounty, and the other one we call the spread. The bounty is the idea that we will have vastly more wealth and productivity and income. 
productivity is already growing. It's, we have record levels of wealth in the United States and other Western countries, record level of GDP per capita, record level of profits. So that's all good news. But we're also seeing that income distribution is spreading out. Some people are becoming much wealthier and other people are beginning to fall behind. Uh -huh. In fact, in the United States, the median income, the income at the 50th percentile, is lower today than it was in the 1990s. According to official estimates, about $4,000 lower. And that's not because the country has gotten poorer. As I just said, the country's getting wealthier. Uh -huh. But what's happened is that most of that additional income has gone to a very small group of people, maybe 1% of the people. The same trend is actually happening in almost every uh, industrialized country in the world. It's happening all over Europe. It's uh -huh. happening in Japan. So there are some deep forces at work that are creating both bounty uh -huh. and also the spreading out of distribution. Well, this was the sort of really aha moment when we did this work. Is that at first I couldn't understand how could it be that median income is going down if we have all these wonderful breakthroughs. And then I realized as I looked at the economics of it that while digital progress does grow the economic pie, mm -hmm. there's simply no economic law that says that everyone's going to benefit evenly or even at all. Mm -hmm. It's possible for a group of people to be made worse off, and that group that's made worse off could be you know, 1% of the population, like people who make horseshoes, mm -hmm. or it could be a very large percentage of the population. It could be 50, 60, 70% of the population. In particular, the technologies of the second machine age tend to be digital. Yeah. And these digital technologies make it possible to codify a process, reduce it to a digital algorithm, mm -hmm. and then once you have it digitized, you can make a copy of it. Mm -hmm. You can make 10 copies. You can make 100 million or a billion copies. Mm -hmm. And every one of those copies can be made for almost zero cost. Mm -hmm. And every one of those copies is a perfect replica of the original. Mm -hmm. And every one of those copies can be transmitted almost instantaneously anywhere in the country or anywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. So these copies are free, perfect, and instant. Those are three characteristics we didn't have for other goods and services before. And they lead to some weird and wonderful economics. Um, they create the bounty, lots of cheap uh, digital goods that we didn't have before. But they also create this growing spread. Because when you have those kind of economics, you tend to get winner-take-all uh, markets. The good thing about the second machine age is that we're going to produce far more wealth and income. Productivity will be higher, but we will also have less demand for human labor in many areas, and perhaps in all areas. In that case, we are faced with a dilemma because the basic way that most societies work is that humans trade their labor for income. And if labor becomes less valuable, then it's harder to see how that system will work. Where will they get the income? Will we have to think of some other way? for them to get the income? Will there perhaps be uh, a basic income? Or will we give capital ownership shares more widely distributed? Or perhaps we'll find a way to supplement labor income with additional funds to make up the difference. But it's a dilemma that we're going to have to confront um, because it, it should be good news that we can create more wealth with okay. less work. But it won't be good news if we don't make adjustments to our society and our institutions. There are three broad categories where we could do a lot better than we're doing now. The first one is in education. Uh, education has always been one of the ways that humans have competed against technology. You could say there's a race between technology and education. And for most of the 20th century, we did very well by educating people better and better. So that, for instance, when um, agricultural labor was automated, 80, 90 percent of Americans used to work on the farm, similarly in other countries. In the United States, it's now less than 2%. Uh -huh. okay. But those people didn't all become unemployed. Instead, they found new jobs. And education was part of the solution. Um, first mass primary education, then high schools and secondary education, and increasingly college. And government had some big investments to make that possible. 
going forward, it's not going to be enough to simply invest more in the same old education we had in the past. Mm -hmm. We'll have to reinvent education. Um, the skills that were taught in the 20th century, sitting in rows of desks, listening to an, a teacher instructor, and being quiet while the, the lesson plan was instructed, that is not what we need in the second machine age. That might have been important for the first machine age, for industrial assembly line labor. Henry Ford wanted obedient workers for the assembly line. But in the second machine age, we need people who are creative, who have good interpersonal skills, and that requires a different kind of education that doesn't uh, create conformists, but rather creates people who have many different kinds of new ideas. Wow. And I think that can be taught. Yeah. And in fact, some of the new technologies of the digital era, um, so-called MOOCs, Massive Online Courseware, and the ability to measure data and personalize instruction could be used to foster more creativity in education. Now, the second big policy that I think we need to adopt is increased entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. The reason for more entrepreneurship is not because I think all those people who lost their jobs in traditional industries should now go and become entrepreneurs. Instead, the real reason we need more entrepreneurs is that the entrepreneurs are the ones who are responsible for, they're in charge of inventing yeah. new industries, yeah. new yeah. goods, new services, new jobs. As the old ones disappear, we need people to invent these new industries the way Steve Jobs did or Bill Gates or other entrepreneurs did. Um, government hasn't historically been very good at inventing whole new industries mm -hmm. or, or, or professors from MIT. It's, it's entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah. And we have some entrepreneurs, but we need even more of them to speed up this invention process. And government and society could do more to foster the entrepreneurship. It's a hopeless strategy to try to stop the technological change Instead, we have to realize that technology will change, and the response is to think of new things we can do with these technologies. Yeah. And that would be something that I'd like to see speeding up um, as well. And then the third big policy I think we could do mm -hmm. to um, improve the situation in society is some big changes in tax policy. Yeah. Um, specifically, right now, many of the taxes are on labor, and there are special mandates um, Social Security, pension, other things that we require employers to pay whenever they hire somebody. Well, one of the basic laws of economics is if you want less of something, you tax it. If you want more of something, you subsidize it. So effectively, for many years, we have been penalizing the employment of humans. Yeah. Maybe that wasn't so bad when we had plenty of jobs to go around, but now it's becoming very damaging, mm -hmm. and we need to encourage employment. So in the book, we recommend a negative income tax yeah. on low-wage labor, that um, if somebody's having difficulty finding a job that they, that they maybe um, employers haven't figured out something useful for them to do, instead of saying, well, sorry, you can't work then, we would say, let's give you a subsidy mm -hmm. so that um, even if you're only earning, you know, uh, five or seven euros per hour, um, the government would add some additional money to bring it up to 10 or 12 mm -hmm. euros mm -hmm. per hour. Mm -hmm. And then they could make a living wage um, and they would continue to work and it would also achieve some income distribution. I don't think we are yet in a society where we can have uh, we've eliminated the economic problem. I don't think we're yet in a society where we don't have to work. So I, I think it's probably counterproductive to, to jump ahead to this world where we imagine we have replicators and we shouldn't build an economic system on the assumption mm -hmm. that we have solved the economic problem before we actually solve it. Yeah. So the first step is to continue with the advances in technology. So we have the robots and artificial intelligence and other technologies that allow us to create more wealth. As we get to that stage, I think we will be able to solve more of our economic problems. In the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we will continue to need a lot of people in the labor force. There's still going to be a lot of value from uh, basic work, and um, in, there's going to be an increasing amount of value created by um, a small group of people who uh, invent new software and other kinds of innovations that can be digitally replicated. And I think we should encourage that creation of those kinds of inventions going forward. 
but we have to recognize that it's also leading to an increasingly uneven income distribution, mm -hmm. and we should address that by trying to get more people involved in that invention process mm -hmm. through education mm -hmm. and more broad entrepreneurship, and also through uh, redistribution, taxes, basic income, um, starting at a low level that uh, even out some of the extreme outcomes. If we do that, I think we'll be on a smoother path towards this eventual world where robots produce both most of the basic income. But let's not assume that we're there yet.